Can you guys believe the latest statistics on maternal morbidity and mortality in the United States? No, I can't. Did you guys know that approximately one to 10 obstetric patients per 1,000 deliveries are admitted to the ICU every year? Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, if only we could decrease those numbers. G2P1001 who's mm -hmm. admitted at 38 weeks in labor. Mm -hmm. She does have a history of atrial fibrillation, okay. but it's well controlled on medication. She has an, a history of an uncomplicated vaginal delivery in the past. Okay. Given this patient's history of atrial fibrillation, she is going to be at an increased risk for cardiovascular events. Since we were talking this morning about more maternal morbidity and mortality, do you mind talking about some of the key physiologic changes that occur in pregnancy that could affect maternal care? Yeah, uh, total blood volume is increased by 50%. Mm -hmm. There's an increased plasma volume, which causes dilution of many circulating factors. Anemia occurs, which limits oxygen transport. Peripheral vasodilation and decreased systemic vascular resistance lead to an increased cardiac output. Systemic vascular resistance begins to increase again at 32 weeks. When greater than 20 weeks gestation, the uterus compresses the inferior vena cava and aorta. An incompetent gastroesophageal sphincter predisposes patients to regurgitation and aspiration with loss of consciousness. Oxygen consumption increases. Tidal volume and minute volume increase to support cardiac output. Elevation of the diaphragm decreases residual lung volume and increases rapid desaturation and acidosis. Mild respiratory alkalosis limits a pregnant patient's ability to compensate for additional acidosis. The larynx is displaced anteriorly with increased blood flow and edema. Great job. Now let's go check on Miss Smith. Okay. Hey, Miss Smith. Hey, Robin. Hey. Hey, Miss Smith. How are you doing? Miss hmm. Smith? I'm going to try sternal rub. Miss Smith? She's not responding. I can't feel a pulse. Robin, go ahead and push the code button. Alexa, I'm going to have you take the backboard off and I'm going to drop the bed. Let's go ahead and tilt her and we're going to begin chest compressions. Robin, will you please back the patient? Let's go ahead and get the AED pads on and I'm going to displace the uterus. When a maternal code is called, there are several additional teams that need to be called in for help. Those include additional nursing staff, NICU, ICU, anesthesia, and maternal fetal medicine. She's in pulseless electrical activity. During a maternal code, there are several additional considerations with ACLS that need to be considered. One, start chest compressions. Two, displace the uterus in a left lateral tilt or by manual displacement to improve venous return. However, manual displacement is preferred to perform effective CPR. Three, perform chest compressions higher on the sternum due to gravid uterus pushing abdominal contents and diaphragm and thus the heart upwards. Four, quick assessment of gestational age. If greater than 20 weeks, begin thinking about resuscitative hysterotomy regardless of viability. Five, follow the same ACLS guidelines as you would with a non-pregnant patient as any potential risks to baby are outweighed by benefit to the mother. Six, fetal monitoring is not recommended during the resuscitation process. Hey, what's going on? This is Miss Smith. She's a 30-year-old G2P1 at 38 weeks, history of AFib. She was noted to be unresponsive with no pulse, so we've started chest compressions and we're preparing to intubate. Hold compressions. How long have you been doing compressions? Almost two minutes. Okay, let's be prepared with Epi at the two-minute mark if she doesn't have a pulse. Agree. What are we suspecting is the cause of her arrest? We suspect an amniotic fluid embolism, but we can't rule out other causes of a maternal code. The most common causes of maternal code include hemorrhage, cardiovascular events, amniotic fluid embolism, magnesium toxicity, pulmonary embolism, arrhythmia, heart failure, sepsis, preeclampsia, endocrine emergencies, or trauma. Yes, I agree. AFE sounds highly likely. Have we considered a bedside hysterotomy? We can. Consider a hysterotomy if the patient is not resuscitated after four minutes or two rounds of CPR. We'll consider it at that point. 
Bedside hysterotomy should be considered during maternal cardiovascular resuscitation in patients with an estimated gestational age greater than 20 weeks. This is performed for maternal benefit to improve venous return by relieving compression on the IVC. The only instrument needed is a scalpel and the incision can be fan and steel or vertical per the provider's discretion. This should be performed regardless of viability because remember, this is for maternal benefit. Shouldn't we go to the operating room for the hysterotomy? No, we never go to the OR when CPR is in progress. A bedside hysterotomy should always be performed here at bedside during a maternal resuscitation. I've got a scalpel, let's get the hemorrhage part. It's been four minutes. Let's check for a pulse. She has no pulse. We're gonna proceed with hysterotomy. The team performing chest compressions continues while the hysterotomy is made. The baby is handed off to the awaiting NICU staff. The uterus is then reapproximated for hemostasis and the abdomen is packed. It's been two minutes. I'm checking for pulse. She has a pulse. She's in normal sinus rhythm. Let's anticipate a hemorrhage. Should go ahead and start the massive transfusion pro protocol and let's move to the OR. In every obstetric emergency, a debrief should be performed with the team discussing first what went well, what could have gone better, and what we would do differently next time. The debrief is also an opportunity to confirm details of the code with the team members to help with consistency and documentation of the event. <music>